Hello and welcome. Tonight, against mounting insecurity in the country, federal government drops bombshell, says bandits and Boko Haram fighters are joining forces against the state, says internal security reforms to hold sooner than later. National Assembly condemns killings as House of Representatives call authorities to invite mercenaries to boost war against terror. All Progressive's Congress presidential hopeful Bola Tinubu says he's the most qualified aspirant for the highest office in the land. And in international news from London, there are growing signs that Russia could be on the verge of capturing the key southern port city of Mariupol. And on business news tonight, Senate confirms President Buhari's four nominees as his active commissioners of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission following consideration of a report of the Committee on Petroleum Resources. On sports news tonight, four shortlisted bidders to buy Chelsea Football Club have until the end of Thursday to submit their final offers. And from Abuja, ahead of the 2023 general elections, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, discovers over a million valid, invalid registration of voters that is to sanction staff responsible for the infraction. Security takes center stage today as a new dimension appears to be emerging in the continued attacks being recorded in different parts of the country. Now, the federal government is claiming that Boko Haram members and bandits are now working in collaboration to carry out attacks. According to the Minister of Information, al Hajilai Mohammed, the preliminary report of the March 28th attack on a Kaduna-bound train showed that Boko Haram and bandits orchestrated the attacks. Our correspondent, Kayla Maguire, reports that this formed part of the briefing after the Federal Executive Council meeting today. Insecurity and vandalism were the focus of the question and answer sessions after the Federal Executive Council meeting chaired by President Muhammadu Buhari. In January, over 200 people were killed following attacks by bandits in Zamfara State. Ten soldiers were killed and an undisclosed number were injured at the military base in Berningwari, Kaduna State when it was attacked by bandits. And a passenger train headed to Kaduna State from Abuja was also attacked by bandits, with many killed and kidnapped by the bandits. When asked about the activities of bandits in northwest Nigeria, the Minister of Information and Culture updates on the preliminary report on the Kaduna-bound train attack, attributing the attacks in northwest Nigeria to a collaboration between bandits and Boko Haram terrorists. Now what's happening now is that there's a kind of unholy handshake between bandits and Boko Haram insurgents. And uh, the preliminary reports of what transpired at, uh, the, at, you know, at the Kaduna train you know, attack shows that there's been a kind of uh, uh, you know, collaboration between the bandits and the, and, and the, dis, and the dislodged Boko Haram, uh, you know, fighters from the northeast. Epileptic power supply has become a mainstay in the daily lives of Nigerians, causing loss of revenue in both public and private establishments. In just 2022, the nation's power grid has collapsed five times, with the most recent one caused by what the Minister of Power describes as vandalism on a transmission tower on the Odukani Ikotek Bene 330 kV double circuit transmission line, leading to a loss of about 400 megawatts of generation. He believes these acts of vandalism are also acts of sabotage. You can call it a sabotage because how can somebody go and pull down a 330 tower to cause this havoc to the whole country? What do you call that? Continuous vandalization of power installations across the country leading to continuous loss of Nigeria's power grid. 
could this be sabotage? The Minister of Power believes that it is. While the Nigerian people come to grips with the devastating effects of bandit attacks on the trains in Kaduna, as well as other bandit attacks across the country, this new handshake between Boko Haram and bandit groups could create a whole new dimension to this asymmetrical warfare, one that the Nigerian government has to confront immediately before it blossoms. From the State House in Abuja, Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the president has reacted to calls by Northern Elders Forum asking him to resign due to insecurity in Nigeria. In a statement, the senior special assistant on media and publicity, Mr. Gaba Shehu, explains that while the president doesn't wish to be drawn into the high decibel in the media, the resignation call is not a solution to the security problems facing the country, adding that the situation built up to a worrisome level following decades of neglect. Concerning the attacks on Kaduna and Niger State's axis, Mr. Shehu adds that security agencies have realigned and reorganized ongoing operations, saying the structures are being reinforced with land-based assets to increase the efficiency of troops and intelligence, equally being reinforced on one hand, while the air defense system is also being reinforced with newly acquired jets and drones and training for operators hastened to meet the current exigencies. The statement adds that similar major operations are going on in the southeast and the south-south, where the economic life wire of the nation and the electricity transmission lines are currently being secured from saboteurs. And against the backdrop of the continued attacks and killings by terrorists and other criminal elements in parts of the country, the House of Representatives is backing the call for the hiring of mercenaries to tackle the menace. The lawmakers arrived at this resolution after the Chairman, House Committee on Police Affairs, called for the sack of the Minister of Defence and National Security Advisor over the security challenges. The same issue dominated deliberations in the upper chamber where Senator George Sekibo expressed frustration at the unending killing of Nigerians. It's the season of politics in Nigeria as the 2023 general election looms and so politicians are jostling for various elective positions. However, as political activities hold sway, a frightening situation continues behind the scenes unabated. The killing of Nigerians by terrorists. Nigerians in Kaduna, Niger, Zamfara, as well as Benue, Kastina and Plateau states are under constant threat of being attacked and killed by terrorists. When 170 Nigerians die in a day... A frustrated Senator George Sekibo cannot hide his dismay at the deaths of Nigerians in the hands of Moraldin terrorists. When 170 Nigerians die in a day, 25 die maybe another that day, and we are seeing it as... We are, we are rubbing it off. That it's just a person. It's a controversial experience. Nigerians are dying, and we are here to protect them. Every day we come here, we hear about dead, 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 dead. Get off for one minute silence. Get off for one minute silence. It is enough. I think it is enough. Either we get a solution to it, or we don't take this person out there again. But we are embarrassing the Senate and the nation. Senator Sekibo's outburst is in response to a motion on the killings of several people in Plateau and Benue states days ago. I do not think there is anybody that can justify. The House of Representatives also debates the security situation in the country following two motions of urgent national importance on the attacks in Benue and Plateau states. Who is responsible for the safety, for the security of lives and properties of the people of this country? Of course, without any fear of political misrepresentation, it is Mr. President. In my own local community that I'm mentioning, we had a soldier who was supposed to, supposed to be in Zamfara having uh, given pass for consecutively six months who was arrested giving uniforms to the bandits. The chairman of the House Committee on Police Affairs questions why President Buhari has refused to let go of the Minister of Defense and National Security Advisor. The minority leader recommends that President Buhari takes drastic steps to confront the security crisis in the country. If the president means well to this country, and if we are really trying to look for a solution, he has to immediately sack the National Security Advisor. Two, he has to remove his Minister of Defense. 
federal government should, as a matter of urgency, evoke the provision of Section 83, Subsection 1, as it relates to contingency fund, to enable the government employ the mercenaries to quell this insurgency that is ravaging our country. Federal lawmakers also recalled the security summit it held in 2021 and questioned the federal government's failure to implement the recommendations of that summit. Staying with security, students of the College of Health Science and Technology, Safe in Zamfara State, are not having the best of times following the abduction of five of their colleagues this morning by bandits who invaded the school. A source from the area told Channels Television that the five students were abducted from their residence outside campus, but one of them was able to escape. The source adds that the bandits could not gain entrance to the school area due to heavy presence of security personnel. According to police authority in the state, which confirmed the incident, the command has deployed troops to trail the bandits and rescue the victims. Meanwhile, in Benue State, the death toll from the violence in Guma and Taka local government areas has risen to 24. The governor, Samuel Otom, is appealing to the federal government to take a definite stand against killing in the state. Addressing journalists on his administration's efforts in clearing the blockade mounted at Tio Tor, the community where 16 persons were killed along the Bokomakodi Federal Highway, Governor Otom asked the youth to come forward with a territorial defense plan. Afraid and in a hurry, one after the other, these locals can't wait to leave their ancestral homes to avoid being the next victims after Tuesday's brutal attack on two communities in Taka and Guma local government areas that left 24 people dead. For these fleeing residents, including women and children, the means of transportation is inconsequential as long as they can escape further attacks leaving behind a deserted community. One of the victims, a young man who got hit by a bullet, recounts his ordeal. Last night, on my way from the market, four unsuspected headsmen attacked me, and as I tried to escape, they shot at me and the bullets hit my back and my stomach. However, I ran with the injuries to my house. At this local government headquarters, a one-month-old baby whose mother was killed is brought to the traditional ruler, while the council chairman provides more insight. After they killed the mother, uh, the person that brought the child said that they have killed his own two, and they are taking his own inside the room and rock it. When he was running, then he, he saw the baby climb. That is why he carried the baby and they brought to me. 12.31 a.m., I was called upon the, the Fulani headers attacked uh, Tio Tu community and a lot of people were killed. So it's so barbaric. We really condemn, we really condemn the killings in Benue State. While political and traditional rulers gather to chart a way forward, Governor Samuel Tom calls for greater action by the federal government to secure the citizens and ask the people to take responsibility for their safety. One day, more than 20 people killed. This is not right. I will continue to say it. But I have told my people, defend yourselves. If you need help from me, I'm ready to give you that help to defend yourself. We're no longer going to keep quiet or fold our arms again to allow these people to continue to kill us in this manner. Although the police is yet to comment on the attack, local authorities say 16 persons were killed in Taka, while eight were killed in Guma, the governor's local government area, with many persons now displaced further worsening the already stretched humanitarian situation in the state. In part two after the break, we switch to political stories as Taraba State Governor Dara Sishako supports Soning and the People's Democratic Party. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. 
Federal government drops bombshell, says bandits and Boko Haram fighters are joining forces against the state, says internal security reforms to hold sooner than later. National Assembly condemns killings as House of Representatives calls authorities to invite mercenaries to boost war against terror. All Progressives Congress presidential hopeful Bola Tinubu says he's the most qualified aspirant for the highest office in the land. And there are growing signs that Russian forces could capture the key southern port of Mariupol. To legal matters where a former federal director of pensions, Mr. John Yakubu Yusuf, is to spend six years in prison. This comes as the Supreme Court today affirmed the jail term imposed on him for misappropriating 22.9 billion naira police, police pension fund. Delivering judgment in an appeal filed by Mr. Yusuf, the Apex Court also ordered him to refund the amount to the federal government. This is the end of the road for a former director of pensions, Mr. John Yakubu, who is challenging the decision of the Court of Appeal, which had in 2018 sentenced him to six years imprisonment for misappropriating the sum of 22.9 billion naira meant for police pension, as the Apex Court has affirmed the decision of the appellate court. In a unanimous judgment of the Supreme Court, read by Justice Tijani Abubakar, the Apex Court says the appeal of the former pension director seeking to set aside the six-year jail term against him was frivolous and devoid of merit. The court held that the former director and others engaged in fraudulent practices must be told in clear language through court judgments that it is no longer business as usual. He further held that victims of the convicted director deserved restitution, which can only be achieved through justice. The Supreme Court further held that the judgment of the Federal Capital Territory High Court, which in 2016 sentenced Yusuf to two years imprisonment with an option of 750,000 naira, was a slap on the wrist. Justice Abubakar further adopted the judgment of the Court of Appeal, which imposed a six-year jail term on the former pension director and also directed him to make a refund of 22.9 billion naira to the federal government. The Council to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission applauds the judgment, while Mr. Yakubu's counsel speaks on the refund to the federal government. As you have to go and take uh, pension money belonging to police officers, I'd say it's a, it's a gross offence which the courts, the Supreme Court, frowns at. So in your words, how do you describe this judgment from the Supreme Court? Highly commendable. Highly commendable. All we can see in our tradition is to give thanks to the court for the industry it exhibited in getting to reaching that conclusion. Can he meet up with that Well, I, order? Um, I'm not the one. <laughs> so um, it is um, left for the court to figure out how to enforce that um, part of the judgment. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, had arraigned Yakubu before the Federal Capital Territory High Court in 2016, where he admitted committing fraud and subsequently entered into a plea bargain with the anti-graft agency and was sentenced to two years imprisonment with an option of 750,000 naira fine, which he promptly paid and escaped imprisonment. And through politics, following his meeting with the serving senators of the All Progressives Congress, the Vice President, Professor Yemi Shibajo, has now met with serving members of the House of Representatives from the party as he joins the race to get the APC's presidential ticket. The Vice President hosted the House members to a dinner at the banquet hall of the State House, which was followed by a closed-door meeting. The lawmakers, however, left the banquet hall with no word to State House correspondents on what was discussed, and none could tell what whether if, like the Senate, the Vice President was seeking their support for his presidential bid.
Meanwhile, the national leader of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Tinubu, says he remains the best qualified to emerge the All Progressives Congress flag bearer for the 2023 presidential election. The APC leader was speaking in Lagos during a meeting with former and current APC lawmakers whom he urged to support his bid. Only right to stand before you wishing and requesting for your support to be called in 2023 elected president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Why? What do I want? Why do I want it? I can tell you, I'm well educated. Sound, brilliant, courageous, one of the best alumni of Chicago State University. Check it out. Left the school with honors. I was a tutor as a student of my fellow classmates. And I was one of the most sorted after graduate of that period, recruited by the best accounting and financing in the world. I was. I have five jobs before my month of graduation waiting for me. And to achieve honors, sumla kumla is not easy. Why you stay after work? I did put all together because I was focused, I was effective, I was organized. And able to juggle my time table and build my line on a straight lane of athleticism. I've contributed immensely, more than any other person running today to wish to become so. I have been a good example. Great. Daring, can do attitude, and I've never lost one single election. And it's more political stories from Abuja Studios, where Linda Kigwe is standing by. Hello, Linda. Hello, Millicent. Now, staying with politics, some other presidential aspirants under the PDP platform today embarked on an intense lobbying of the party's organs and leaders. Three of the aspirants met separately with members of the PDP National Working Committee, as well as the Board of Trustees in Abuja, asking for their support to clinch the presidential ticket for the next general elections. Meanwhile, the PDP national chairman, Senator Iyo Chao is assuring all 17 presidential aspirants on the platform of the party of a level playing ground. The People's Democratic Party National Secretary comes alive again as supporters of various presidential aspirants stormed the party's headquarters in Abuja to campaign for their principles ahead of the proposed May 28th and 29th presidential primaries. On their part, the presidential aspirants are also involved in intense lobbying, advancing reasons for the party to allow them to fly the presidential ticket. In two separate meetings, Governor Bala Mohammed of Bauchi State and former Senate President Senator Pius Aim are asking the PDP National Working Committee for their support. They both also advanced reasons for them to be considered for the party's presidential ticket. I have one vision for Nigeria. 
And that vision is to build a nation. And if you like, rebuild Nigeria to that nation that all of us shall be proud of. I am not going to learn on the job. I have been in that corridor. I am not going to depend on people. I have an idea of what the problems are and clarity of vision of what the solutions could be. If I run this country for one year and you don't see the difference between light and darkness, you can recall me. Yeah. Your Excellency, I'm offering myself to run for this office out of the need to serve because I have served in various, at various levels. I know what Nigerians want. What they need is nothing, good governance, justice and equity. In a similar vein, the former Senate President Senator Bukala Saraki meets with members of the PDP Board of Trustees to lobby for the party's presidential ticket. I'm saying that it is a time because where the country is today, they should look at who is best that can turn around this country, who has the capacity to address the issues that this country needs, who has shown leadership at the point where, who has shown direction, who has shown he has a, that we should not look at it according to sentiment, ethnicity, religion. We should look at who is a Nigerian for all Nigerians and who can take PDP and make a PDP government that Nigerians will begin to see a brighter future. However, the PDP national chairman is appealing to the aspirants to let parties' interests prevail over the aspirations. He also assures them of a level playing field. It is my prayer that all the aspirants work together because it is the unity of the party that will give us victory. We will make sure that as in the PDP tradition, everything will be done transparently. At the end of the day, Ordinary PDP member will determine who will be our presidential candidate. 17 presidential aspirants jostling for one ticket is in no way a main task before the leadership of the PDP. As political watchers say, the party's performance at the forthcoming general elections will largely depend on how the party leadership is able to manage the election process. Still ahead on the news at 10, Senate confirms President Buhari's four nominees as executive commissioners of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission. That's on Business News. Join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10, coming to you live from Abuja. As the lobbying continues among the PDP presidential hopefuls, the debate over zoning remains in the front burner. And Taraba State Governor Darius Ishaku says zoning is a masterstroke for the party. According to him, the arrangement is a critical way of making every region to be part of governance in the country, and the PDP must abide by the formula. He was speaking when a group of the party executives and delegates appointed him as their grand patron at the government's house in Jalingo, the state's capital. PDP is the party that is formed originally as a political party. And I love the beauty of PDP with its zoning because that helps us that everybody in Nigeria becomes a part and parcel of the governance. We must abide by the zoning formula. It is a way of bringing everybody to be part of governance. If we say no, then we too will form part of minorities when the formula enlarges.
In continuation of his tour to seek the support of party delegates for his presidential ambition, River State Governor Nisum Wike has visited Cross River State. Governor Wike explained to the PDP stakeholders in Calabar, the Cross River State capital, that he is the only presidential candidate to restore power back to the party. For the state chairman of the party, Cross River State will give him the support he desires to become the next president as they have no other choice than to support their own. Your Excellency, we are very, very proud of you. Uh, I've had occasions when at Abuja people try to talk to me about supporting some aspirants. I usually cut the conversation very short. I say not for us in Cross River State. We don't, we don't even have a moral right to think of an alternative. That remains, I believe, our position. I am the one. Give me the ticket. Listen, listen. Give me the ticket. Give me this ticket. Election is over. I have come to talk to the delegates who are members of PDP. The campaign for delegates is a different thing and different style. The campaign for Nigerians to vote for PDP is a different style. Is not correct? I'm not sending people to come and talk to you. I want you to see me face to face. I want you to see me face to face. Some people come and talk to you, they were sent by people. How do you vote for somebody you have not seen? Do you vote for who you have not seen? I have respect for all of you who are delegates. And that's why I say I will come by myself. I will come by myself so that you can see my face and know that this is the man who said you should support him. Meanwhile, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, has been given an update on the continuous voter registration exercise ahead of Yekiti and Oshun governorship polls. Addressing a news conference in Abuja, Professor Yakubu explains that the registration exercise, which covers the period from June 2021 to January 2022, had a total of over 2.5 million registrations. While valid registration for same period came to about 1,390,519 million, invalid registration stood at 1,173,000. He warned against re-registration of eligible voters by INEX staff, maintaining that any staff aiding the process will face persecution. And that's all from Abuja. Back to you, Millicent. My thanks, Linda. Some company news now. Providing power to households and industries is crucial for economic development. And as part of efforts to achieve this objective, NG Energy Access Nigeria has commissioned a mini-grid renewable power project in Bangla, that's in Niger State. At the commissioning, which was attended by Niger State government officials and the French ambassador to Nigeria, the CEO of NG Energy Access Nigeria explains that the World Bank assisted project is part of solar home system and mini grid solutions to be deployed to underserved communities in sub Saharan Africa. You don't see much in the way of infrastructure as you approach Bagba, Niger State. But what NG Energy Access Nigeria sees is opportunity, which translates to a mission to light up the community as a visit by the team from NG Energy Access Nigeria ensues, with representatives of Niger State Government, French Ambassador to Nigeria, and top officials of the company. The Niger State Commissioner for Works, Maman Musa, representing the governor, indicates why the project has the state government support. There's no doubt that with the commissioning of this mini grid in this community today, this will serve as a catalyst to many businesses that will spring up within short possible time, which will change the economic status of our women and youth within battles, thereby improving the standard of living. 
Over 300 households in Bagua will have electricity for the first time, and the French ambassador to Nigeria commends the company. Energy, energy access. I know this is the first mini grid out of, there's a long series to follow, but I wanted to really to commend you for being bold, coming here and doing it and making it um, happen. She celebrates the occasion with cultural performers in a dance. The CEO of NG Energy Access Nigeria explains why the project is so important. Our company, NG Energy Access, Combine two components of access to energy, solar home system and mini-grid solutions. Their complementarity is the cornerstone of our mission to deliver life-changing, affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy solutions. And the commissioning takes place. As the people of Bangwa enjoy electricity, the company expresses a target of building more than 100 mini-grids, improving the standard of living not only in Niger State, but all over the country. Business news up next. Here's Taniola Shubawale. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks a lot, Millicent. Welcome to Business News. The Senate has confirmed President Mohamedou Buhari's four nominees as his active commissioners of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission. This is coming a few weeks after the president, in written communication, sought the Senate's confirmation of the executive commissioners for the oil sector regulator. The nominees confirmed include Dr. Nuhu Abib, Dr. Kilichi Oyekachi Ufegbu, Captain. At Onlaga, Roland John and Mr. Jide Adeola. Their confirmation followed the consideration of a report of the Committee on Petroleum Resources at the plenary on Wednesday. The African Development Bank Group is set to hold its annual meetings in Accra, Ghana from May the 23rd to the 27th with the theme Achieving Climate Resilience and a Just Energy Transition for Africa. This year's meeting mark a return to in-person sessions following virtual meetings over the last two years. The meetings will offer bank governors representing institutions 54 African and 27 non-regional member countries a forum to share the climate change and energy transition challenges that their countries face. And Nigeria's stock market maintains its winning streak for a third consecutive day in the week, adding 87.48 billion naira to the gains recorded in Tuesday's session. In the John Mekwa tells us Thank more. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stock market report. Well, it seems the market has settled in the positive territory, at least for now. So for the fourth straight day, we see the all share index gaining and uh, keeping the bull in charge once again. <laughs> And most impressive on the activity chart is today's value. It went up from 4.58 billion naira yesterday to 9.951 billion naira. That's about 100% jump. Wow. In just one trading day. Well, let's look at uh, the top trades. Now, the banking sector is still leading top trades. Three tier one lenders accounted for almost... 3 billion naira in value of today's trade. Jitico is gaining for the third straight day today. Its share price was up 75 cobalt to close at 24 naira 40 cobalt. MTN Nigeria is also sustaining that winning steam. Uh, it was up today 1 naira 90 cobalt to close at 213 naira for a unit of its share. It seems to be a positive and green trading week. We hope it sustains that to the end of the week. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And now let's find out how major global stock markets ended midweek trading session.
that's business news tonight. It's back to Millicent. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thank you, Tony. Russia says over a thousand Ukrainian Marines have surrendered in the besieged port of Mariupol, but Ukraine denies this. According to the city's deputy mayor, the Ukrainian troops there are still fighting around the giant Azov's, uh, Azov Stor steel works in the port, which is one of the two areas not under Russian control. Well, here's Simon Pusey with more on this and other international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. There are growing signs that Russia could be close to capturing the key southern port city of Mariupol, which has suffered a devastating six-week assault. Russia claims 1,026 Ukrainian soldiers have laid down their arms in the besieged city. The southern port has been under attack for weeks and is believed to be close to falling into Russian hands. The Ukrainian Defence Ministry denies the reports. The Polish, Lithuanian, Latvian and Estonian presidents have travelled to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, to meet President Zelensky. Zelensky described the trip as a gesture of support for Ukraine. Officials say the meeting focused on ways to assist a Ukrainian civilians as well as the military. Meanwhile, Ukraine says it has arrested the country's most senior pro-Russian politician, Viktor Medvedchuk. The opposition party leader had been under house arrest, suspected of treason, but fled shortly after the Russian invasion. President Zelensky has offered Russia to trade him for captured Ukrainians. Finland has begun a debate which could result in the country applying for NATO membership within a matter of weeks. There are different perspectives uh, to apply uh, NATO membership. Prime Minister Sanna Marin was speaking at a joint news conference with her Swedish counterpart Magdalena Andersson. I think you really must analyze the new situation. According to Finland's foreign ministry, a government commissioned report released today examines the fundamentally changed security environment and will make its way through parliament. An opening debate is planned for a week later. Until recently, most Finns had not wanted to join NATO, but Russia's invasion of Ukraine has prompted some rethinking and latest polls suggest there's now a majority in favor of joining. South African authorities in KwaZulu-Natal province are calling for a state of disaster to be declared after floods wrecked havoc in the area. <laughs> President Cyril Ramaphosa said it was a tragic toll of the force of nature and is visiting the region. Months worth of rain fell in a single day in some areas and mudslides have brought traffic to a standstill. Many people are still missing. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak have rejected calls to resign despite being fined by police for breaking lockdown rules in Downing Street in June 2020. I once again offer a full apology. The Prime Minister, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister's wife all received fixed penalty notices for attending a birthday gathering for the Prime Minister in number 10. As a result, Mr Johnson has become the UK's first serving Prime Minister to be sanctioned for breaking the law. All three have apologised, but opposition MPs say the Prime Minister and Mr Sunak must now resign. They've dishonoured their office. This is the first time in the history of our country that a Prime Minister has been found to be in breach of the law. And then he lied repeatedly to the public about it. Britain deserves better. They have to go. Huge plumes of smoke have been seen billowing from wildfires in the mountains in Rudiso in New Mexico. The wind-driven wildfire burned dozens of homes and triggered evacuations of schools and neighbourhoods in the mountain resort town. Authorities said the fire had burned 150 houses and structures as winds of 90 miles per hour propelled flames through forested canyons. The blaze, known as the McBride Fire, was one of around half a dozen wildfires burning in New Mexico and West Texas. A Ugandan man has secured a deal to produce the nation's first ever animation film for Disney. Raymond Malinga says he wants his work to show the positive sides of Africa and broaden diversity in the industry. Although African content is gaining popularity thanks to growing commissions for series and short films by streaming services like Showmax and Netflix, foreign content is still dominant. The current project is an anthology of short animated movies by African producers set to premiere on the Disney Plus streaming platform later this year. His dream, he said, is to bring on the world stage African film and animation to replicate the success of other African industries. 
And finally, the former Baywatch star Pamela Anderson has made her Broadway debut in the hit musical Chicago in New York. <laughs> Anderson plays the role of Roxy Hart, which she called a dream role. Following her stage debut, fans gave Anderson glowing reviews. She will appear in the show until June the 5th. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thank you, Simon, and welcome to Sports News. Nigerian breweries, PLC makers of Heineken, has again brought the UEFA Champions League trophy to Nigeria as part of their global tour of the trophy. And this year, the trophy is accompanied by former Dutch midfielder Clarence Seedorf. The Dutch midfielder, who was nicknamed the Professor, was accompanied by Nigerian legends Austin Okocha and Daniel Amokachi, as well as the Nigerian Breweries team to the Minister of Youth and Sports as part of the tour. <laughs> The UEFA Champions League trophy arrives at the conference room of Nigeria's Minister of Youth and Sports Development as part of the Abuja leg of the tour of the trophy to the country. <laughs> the trophy is accompanied by Dutch football legend Clarence Sidoff, who is helping to make some contributions to the development of the game in Africa. A uh, year full of ups and downs, challenges that you need to overcome as a team in So these are the various sports I think that. Um, I, have, uh, I have taken with me uh, even after and now focusing on uh, spreading the word, the message, building projects, collaborating um, with uh, organizations, governments to, to make sure that the youth, especially in Africa, with a special focus in Africa, has the opportunity to grow uh, doing sports because sports is the basis. Nigerian Breweries is the brain behind the trophy tour, and the company's director of corporate affairs, who is leading the team, is promising that the company will do more for the growth of sports in Nigeria. Your Excellency, thank you very much for having us here. We know that this has been a real privilege given your very tight schedule. Let me use this opportunity to now formally present and here before us the Champion League trophy and the tour ambassador. Thank you. The choice of bringing the trophy to Nigeria is because of the followership that the tournament enjoys in Nigeria, and the minister is hoping for more partnerships to develop the game in the country, especially since Nigerians have participated in the tournament over the years. Nigerians indeed have made very significant contributions to the UEFA Championship or Champions League over the years, and we can go down memory lane if you need a judge. Kano Wanko, who are teammates with our own dear friend, who is here today, Clarence Sedoff in Ajax in 1995. The UEFA Champions League trophy is then presented to the minister. The tour, powered by international premier Lager Beer Henneken, official partners of the UEFA Champions League, will offer fans and loyal consumers a sight and feel of the iconic trophy. Now Liverpool remain on course for a historic quadruple after a thrilling 3 all draw with Benfica secured a place in the last four. The Reds qualify 6-4 on aggregate and will face Villarreal in the semi-final. Manchester City produced an, a mature and disciplined performance to hold off the challenge of Atletico Madrid at the Wanda Metropolitano and progress to the next round 1-0 on aggregate. The English Premier League champions will face Real Madrid in the semi-final. Now Sports News is back to Melissa. Thank you, Victor. And the main news again. The federal government today claimed that there was a collaboration between bandits and Boko Haram fighters leading to an upsurge in terrorist attacks across the nation. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker. Have a good night and stay safe.